All attendees are in listen-only mode. Excellent. Uh, are we recording? Yes. Yes. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is John Davis. I'm editor of MPA News and project supervisor for OpenChannels.org, the online forum on ocean planning. Also with me is Nick Weiner, uh, project manager for Open Channels. He's handling the, the technical side of this webinar, along with Sarah Carr, coordinator of the EPM Tools Network, an alliance of leading tool users, developers, and training providers in ecosystem-based management. This webinar is co-sponsored by Open Channels, the EBM Tools Network, and MPA News. Over 100 European marine sites have been designated in the UK under EU laws since 1994, yet historically there has been no effective system in place to manage destructive fishing practices in these sites. In today's webinar, Jean-Luc Solant, uh, Senior Biodiversity Officer for Marine Conservation Society, and Catherine Weller, lawyer for Client Earth, will describe how their organizations have collaborated for seven years on a national campaign to protect European marine sites from destructive fishing and how UK authorities and regulators have responded. Uh, this is how the webinar will work. Our presenters will provide their PowerPoints and the audience will see each speaker's presentation on your own computer screen. Uh, then we'll open the floor to questions from you, the audience, for the remainder of the webinar. Uh, we'll conclude the webinar about an hour from now. If you have a question for our presenters, you can submit it in the question box that is in the control panel on your screen, uh, the webinar control panel, and we'll be drawing from those questions throughout the question and answer session. Uh, all right, we'll get started. I'll hand it over to Jean-Luc Solant and Catherine Weller now. Thanks very much, John. So I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, my name is Jean-Luc Solant. I work for the Marine Conservation Society. It's uh, the only UK NGO working primarily on marine issues. Um, most of our work is in the UK. And Client Earth, Catherine Weller works for Client Earth, who's a um, an environmental legal organization. So they make representations for legal, legal cases for the protection of the, the environment, both terrestrial and marine. So this is a piece of work I'm going to introduce you that we've been doing and following for seven years, um, where we've seen um, initially designation of a type of marine protected area and then a, a long time to see actual effective management to come in as we see it. So I'm going to go to the first slide here. In effect, um, we could say that the European marine sites in England were paper parks up until 2012. There was no systematic effective management measure of the damaging fishing activities. Yet, the laws that protect these European marine sites, the Habitats and Birds Directives, Euro marine, European marine sites, have the strongest legal protection framework. If you look at the figure on the, on the right-hand side of the slide, I'm pointing my mouse over here at the moment, you can see the brown areas of the European marine sites and the black line is, with, is waters within 12 nautical miles. Um, so there are offshore sites which are fished by other member states in Europe, but within the line um, are, is the exclusive competency in effect of UK regulators. Um, and there are 108 of these brown sites in there. The blue sites are Scottish sites set up, set up under their own domestic legislation. Green sites are set up under English domestic legislation. So the vast majority and number of sites are the SACs these special areas of conservation, which is a type of European marine site. All a bit confusing, I agree, but in effect, these are all types of marine protected area. Now, the law which establishes their protection was, was enabled through European law and then regulated in different countries in 1994. And there is an article in there which is the principal importance in this law um, for protecting damaging activities that's that Catherine will go into a little bit later. But it was particularly apply, poorly applied to fisheries that were ongoing at the time of the designation of each one of these MPAs. And the last point states that they were designated over a long period between the 1990s and way up to 2010. So there's been a long period of evidence gathering for actually designation of the sites. Um, and I would have to say that management took a back seat at the time of this designation. And in the last 20 years, from this next slide of the map of the southwest of the United Kingdom, the counties of Cornwall and Devon, um, they've seen much, much heavier use of destructive scallop dredging, fishering, 
in these inshore areas. Now, if you look on the image on the left, that's a coral, a Gorgonian coral called the pink sea fan, Unicella varicosa, and the black dots represent areas where those um, pink sea fan colonies occur, and they are synonymous with reef habitat. Now, where you can see the scallop dredging intensity map profile overlay areas of dots of the pink sea fan occurrence, you can see there are problems of where there are, there's a congruence of the fishing activity which is highly damaging and the pink sea fan populations. And we're going to do a publication in marine policy, we hope, by the end of the year to show how this, how this is a problem and how it's since been rectified. Now, these reefs are extremely productive, highly diverse. Um, there are a number of corals on these reefs, sponge communities, bryozoan communities, all providing important ecosystem um, services to the marine environment, and they act as uh, shellfish nurseries to a certain extent. And the effects of fishing over these grounds, particularly in the soft rock areas around Lime Bay, has been shown in the literature and has been seen with visual tools such as photography and sea search divers um, to be fairly destructive, well, very destructive to the habitats. Now this kind of um, interaction of these gears which will become more and more common in the inshore waters came to a head in one site um, in 2006 where um, scallop dredges were phot photographed operating within a European marine site, which was called the Fallon Halford Special Area of Conservation. And um, the argument by the NGOs, in, in this case ourselves, at the time, on our own, to the local regulator was that this is damaging to the feature, which was merle beds, these very, very important, delicate, encrusting algae. Um, and it took 13 months of campaigning to the local regulator, and then subsequently to the national overarching government body, DEFRA, that oversees fisheries um, to stop the fishing activity. But this is a clumsy process. It took 13 months and we believe um, before the fishing was taking place there should have been um, management of the, that sort of fishery and assessment of it before it even visited the site or was allowed in the site. Now, it isn't just Falmouth in the southwest where there, there were these problems. There were other individual sites. So I've mentioned Falmouth and Lime Bay, but there was also Berwickshire, which I'll move my mouse over them. So uh, if you can get this, I hope you're seeing this. This is Falmouth, the area we just mentioned. Lime Bay is a little bit bigger, and there's an area in Berwickshire, North Northumberland, Cardigan Bay, and Pembrokeshire. Um, when we talked to the regulators who were looking after fisheries at the site level, they were saying, they didn't issue the fishing license, therefore they weren't the appropriate body to stop the damaging fishing. They said, talk to the people who issued the license, who are based where the stars are, <laughs> a very clumsy way to show basically the capital of Wales in Cardiff and the capital of England in, in, in London. So the problem was no single organization was taking the lead of dealing with these, these, these failed MPAs. And what we subsequently got in each of these sites was protection after the event of the damaging fishing happening. Um, and in many cases, the, the protection was happening because of the threat of, of fines from the European Commission. Now, this is a clumsy way to do conservation. It's a clumsy way to do conservation of a law that is a singular law that has the same rules, obviously, applying to Wales, England, or individual sites. So we realized there was still a systemic management failure in this process up to 2009. So over to Catherine now. Thanks, Jean-Luc, and hello, everybody. Yes, as Jean-Luc was saying, work at site-specific level can be really impactful, but it would take a long time to repeat the same type of campaign across all of the sites, which, as Jean-Luc was showing you, were various and many. You can make more impact, and in theory, perhaps with less resource, if you can change the system. So if you can get every site regulated on this proactive damage prevention basis uh, that Jean-Luc was highlighting just now, and also, if you can tackle some of the underlying problems which need to be resolved at a national level, then you're going to have much more impact. So Client Earth and the Marine Conservation Society started working together to tackle this systemic failure to, and to prevent damage to all of the protected sites. And um, we argued 
that the existing approach, or some might say lack of approach, was just not compliant with the Habitats Directive, that powerful legal framework that uh, Jean-Luc referred to right at the top of the presentation, and in particular with Article 6 of the Habitats Directive. Now, I think it's just worth saying um, at this point that um, Using legal arguments and alleging non-compliance uh, can really get regulators' attention quite quickly. An argument that the UK was in breach of the Habitats Directive focused the government's mind on the situation because they knew that they ran the risk of NGOs making a complaint to the European Commission which might trigger an infringement action against the UK which would then involve lots of money, potentially huge fines and also time to resolve. So as I say, um, bringing in the law kind of focused minds on the issue. We've mentioned Article 6 and I guess it's appropriate here to just give a quick refresher about uh, Article 6. This is the article in the Habitats Directive that describes the measures that uh, member states in the European Union must take to achieve the goals of the Habitats Directive. So what are they? The goals are to maintain and restore at a favorable conservation status the habitats and species that are protected by the directive. And within Article 6, there are two key paragraphs, and I'm just going to briefly outline them now. We have Article 6.2, Article 6, Paragraph 2, where it requires member states to take appropriate steps to avoid the deterioration of protected habitats and protected species that are present on these protected sites. So this is a very broad obligation on member states and it is crucially applicable to all activities that take place within these sites. Then we have Article 6.3. And this is specific to plans and projects which are undertaken in or around these sites. This article introduces the requirement to undertake an assessment of the, excuse me, of the effect of a plan or project on the site. And basically what it says is that plans or projects can only be allowed if either they do not pose a likely significant effect, technical term there, or if they do pose a likely significant effect, but an appropriate assessment has been carried out that proves that the plan or project will not adversely affect the integrity of the site. So at that point, the uh, activity could go ahead. In our legal campaign um, in England, we argued that both Articles 6.2 and 6.3 required the regulation of fishing activities that are damaging to the habitats and species in these protected sites. And as Jean-Luc said, our key message was that management had to be proactive and not reactive because once damage is done, it's often too late. And, um, and this point is supported by case law from the European Court of Justice that member states must be proactive and not reactive. reactive. But we were also quite pragmatic. I put on the slide here that our strategy was outcome focused. Uh, what we wanted was some action uh, towards protecting these sites um, in practice. And we weren't fussed whether the proactive management came from central government level or from local level, as long as it was actually happening. And so, as you'll see, um, we were quite practical in uh, accepting what government came up with as their revised approach. But before I go on to that, uh, let me touch on a few more of the legal arguments that we utilized. If you can move forward a slide, Jean-Luc. Great. So when you're making out a case that a member state is in breach of Article 6, you, know, you need to show that Article 6 is, is relevant. And as I said, you have two options, Article 6.2, or Article 6.3 because both put an obligation on the member state and the regulator. So we made out a case in respect of England that neither were being satisfied. But I want to focus for a moment now on Article 6.3 because as I already said, for that to apply, we needed to show that fishing was a plan or project, if you remember those were the key words. And the UK was very, very resistant to accepting that fishing was a plan or project. And this was despite the fact that the European Court had already ruled on this question back in 2003, and that's the Waddensee case that we reference on the slide. 
So, a reminder, plan and project are not defined specifically in the Habitats Directive, but in that Warden Z case, the court decided that the definition of project could be imported from another piece of European legislation, the Directive on Environmental Impact Assessments, and crucially, they decided that fishing fell within the concept of that definition of project, which was, or includes, interventions in the natural surroundings and landscape, including those involving the extraction of mineral resources. So, fishing definitely was deemed to fall within the concept of project there. The fishing activity in question in that case, for interest, was actually mechanical cocking, sorry, mechanical cockle dredging. Uh, but I think if you use the court's definitions and logic, there's no real doubt that all types of fishing fall within this concept of plan or project. The UK also showed further resistance, uh, saying that existing and ongoing activities shouldn't be subject to Article 6. Again, that question had already been decided by the EU court, and they said that activities that have been happening for a long time are still subject to Article 6.3. So, we really had the backing of good, strong court case law from the European Court to make our points. But we still had to apply it to the English context. So, Jean-Luc, next slide, please. So, in the UK, as this slide shows, fishing is subject to licensing, and those licenses are granted for two-year periods. Again, when we were making our arguments to uh, the UK government, we applied the logic of the court's decision in the Wadensee case, and we argued that there was no material distinction between the situation in that case and the UK general fishing license. Firstly, on principle, fishing permitted by the UK licenses is clearly an intervention in the natural surroundings and landscape, uh, referencing that definition I discussed earlier, and even on the facts, they're very similar. The license in Wadensee was annual and the cockle dredging had been carried on for several years. So there's no real material difference to the UK situation. Thus, we argued, for fishing to continue in these protected areas, it needed to be subject to the Article 6.3 tests. But enough of the legal arguments for now. Let's get back to telling the story of what happened after we had uh, made all these legal arguments. So, 14th of August 2012 was the key date when the UK government announced a new approach for England, and it is important uh, that we stress that this new approach was only relevant to England. The other areas of the UK have taken slightly different approaches with slightly different timescales. So DEFRA, um, was the, which is the UK Department for Environment, Fisheries and Rural Affairs, they're a central government department and they were the ones who initiated it. They um, announced this new approach was going to be risk-based and on a phased basis, i.e. the first focus would be on sites where significant risk of certain types of fishing um, preventing a feature from achieving its uh, conservation objectives under the legislation would be, would be targeted. Um, really important things in this uh, announcement. Firstly, they acknowledged that the government and fishing regulators in England do have legal obligations to ensure management of fishing activities. Um, secondly, they stated that all existing and potential commercial fishing activities should be subject to an assessment of their impact on, on protected sites. And thirdly, they predicted that there would be a need for regulation to bring in the management measures. So the scene was, was well set, hurrah, uh, it, it was um, a real step forward, but of course intentions are one thing, delivery is, is quite a different case. So we reference here on the slide the implementation group that was set up, and as we say, this included a range of stakeholders and and three environmental NGOs actually have seats on this implementation group. The role of the group, well, that was to advise the government and regulators on the implementation of this revised approach, particularly on the practicalities. It was not to take any management decisions itself. So the main tasks, certainly initially, were to comment on um, the sensitivity of different features to different types of gear, 
uh, and then also on the timetable and of course to discuss implications of the way things were going. And I've mentioned sensitivity because it's important to highlight that this new approach was going to be a matrix-based approach. Um, so let's have a quick look at that matrix on the next slide. There you go, nice and colorful. You'll see um, that this is a gear type and feature interaction matrix. So along the top, you've got the different features and down the side, different gear types. Of course, this is just a, a small extract of a very large table, um, but we thought that would give you uh, a, a, an insight into, into the kind of um, matrix that, that was in use. And you'll also see that um, there are some colors used. And I'll, I'll go through what those different colors are in a minute. Basically, the aim of this matrix was to indicate to a regulator considering um, a particular site and particular types of fishing activity, whether priority management measures should be introduced or whether they needed to do um, an assessment uh, before considering what the appropriate management measures might be. So I, I referenced earlier being um, pragmatic and uh, accepting a phased approach. And underpinning this matrix is the idea that you need to do something quickly where it's obvious that it is needed. And that, that was the priority for, uh, for DEFRA and for the implementation group. And those priorities were these gear feature interactions which are highlighted in red in the matrix. So red um, was the category where it was clear that conservation objectives wouldn't be achieved because a feature is sensitive to a particular type of fishing. Um, the others, the kind of orangey color, which are um, uh, the most prevalent color on this matrix, um, we call them the ambers, and this is where there was doubt as to whether conservation objectives for a feature will be achieved because there is some concern about sensitivity to the type of fishing. And what that meant in terms of the implementation was that the effect will need to be assessed at site level and then appropriate management measures will need to be taken on the basis of that assessment. Um, just at the bottom here, you can see one square, which is green. Uh, green, very simply, um, the feature is highly unlikely to be affected by the type of fishing activity. Now, I would note that that was um, an assessment made based on the activity levels at the time. Uh, and if the conditions change, for example, a huge increase in the and the level of effort, then, then it would need to be re-evaluated, obviously. And then you can also see some blue squares on the matrix, and this is where it was deemed that there was no feasible interaction between gear type and feature. So that gives you um, an idea of some of the categories that we'll go on to talk about, the key ones being reds and ambers. So what was the timeline agreed for all this? Let's have a look at the next slide. Right. Uh, the overall aim under the revised approach was to bring England into compliance with the Habitat Directive by the end of 2016. But there was an interim um, deadline set, which was May 2014, and that was for that red category that we just looked at. So uh, the idea was that um, reds were the priorities and that the management measures would be local regulations, which we called bylaws, and that these turned out to um, close parts of the sites to certain activities. And uh, this is all well and good, but obviously a bit of scrutiny from NGOs is always necessary. So Client Earth and MCS were engaged in the process of getting these bylaws on the books. We discussed had various discussions with the relevant regulators at local level, at central level. We input into stakeholder consult consultations. And of course, we were always sharing our thoughts at the meetings of the implementation group. And as a result um, of everybody's hard work, regulators, fishing industry, and NGOs, by the middle of last year, the last of the 17 bylaws um, dealing with these uh, red situations became effective. They cover 25 sites and have closed about 3,000 square kilometers to bottom toed gear. And if you're interested in more details about those bylaws, then Client Earth uh, and 
MCS produced a status report where we reviewed all of the bylaws. Now, it has to be said that some of them weren't as strong as we'd like to see, but uh, overall, it definitely was progress. Uh, currently, however, we and everybody are working on the next category, which is the AMBER category, working towards the 2016 deadline for that. Uh, this is a more involved process, as I was saying earlier, because it has to go through several steps. Um, they, uh, the regulators are doing tests of likely significant effect, and then where those are positive, they need to move to appropriate assessments, and then if, if those show that there will be an impact, then of course they will need to consider the appropriate management measures and get those uh, through as well. We expect that there will have to be over 5,000, perhaps more, tests of likely significant effect. Uh, and probably nearly a thousand appropriate assessments, but that is all underway. So, back to Jean-Luc now, I think. Okay, I hope you can all hear me. Okay, so one of the interesting things that happened um, during this whole case up till now is government was realizing, we believe, that the, the local regulators who were in the boxes, if you remember back to my map, who are regulating activities at the local level inshore, um, we weren't fit for purpose to sort of make conservation decisions over and above um, management of, of long-term or short-term fisheries interest. So um, what the government did was to instigate a new body called the Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authorities. And this new approach and the pressure from NGOs that delivered this matrix coincided with this new regulator to manage inshore fisheries. There are 10 that are around the English coast, and they have much more of a conservation focus in their membership who vote on the recommendations of their officers and their staff um, on management measures. And those, uh, the committee members that make the decisions are are stakeholders, much like in the implementation group, they're fishermen, they are scientists, they can be recreational anglers and they can be conservationists. And what is exciting about these IFICAs is that they do offer a more resilient governance perspective and long-term view to managing and progressing these sorts of issues. Um, they are vested in the community, um, they have about between 100 and three, 500 square of five, 100 and 500 kilometers in distance of coastline each, approximately. Um, they're often staffed by ex-fishermen. Um, they're in most cases, as I said, a balance of conservation and fishing interests on the committees. So DEFRA was saying we need to deliver this new approach, but they did give all the work, really, in the inshore to the IFCAS to do. But that was, even though providing a huge amount more work, as Catherine has alluded to over the number of tests of likely significance. In terms of the resilience of these measures, we believe that's a good approach. Let me go to the next slide. Okay, so this map shows us the progress of those 17 bylaws that Catherine was talking about. Now, this is obviously a lot to take in, uh, in one view, but all the brown areas are the sites. Um, all the brown areas that are stippled, like, for, uh, like this one and this one, are offshore, which have yet to be managed. But all the inshore sites within the 12 nautical miles are these. Now, the, the black line designates the bylaws that have stopped bottom-toed fishing gears to operate within or around the complete part of those sites. So there's a breakout, pull-out box here, which shows Cornwall and South Devon. And you can see there are certain sites, such as this one off the Lizard and this one off Cape Bank, which are entirely reef. So they were easy to protect and logical to protect. Where some such as this at the Isles of Scilly, you can see the southeast portion and the northwest portion are actually sandy habitat. So in order to deal with the reds, the only area that was protected was the reef and the cobble reef just off it. And you can see another site where there's a certain amount which is left open is this site here, an offshore reef that actually has sand gullies between it. So certain portions of that site aren't actually protected from bottom toe gears. Now moving to um, the east coast of England. Now there's a lot more sedimentary habitat in this area of coast and that has meant that in terms of protecting reef, merle and seagrass beds, much smaller areas of the sea should be 
uh, can be protected. However, we still have issues with this district here, which has protected a rather small portion of um, a, a, an ephemeral feature called a sabellaria reef. And this is a worm reef that tends to come and go um, quite regularly and quite naturally. Um, and the regulators decided to just protect the core area of the reef that is persistent year in, year out. However, our arguments are that larger areas need to be protected to be compliant with the precautionary measures within the habitats directive. Um, and then for the offshore sites here and here, another um, section of stable area reef protected. Now, one of the most exciting things is the adoption of a more ecosystem-based approach to management, which is vested in this site I'm circling with my mouse here, which is the South White Maritime site. And in this portion here, there was particular issues with scallop dredging happening around the time of the process. Now, what was also quite exciting in that area is that there's a lot of very rich sedimentary habitat in there. And the Ithaca chose to not just protect the boulder and cobble reef itself, but slightly more sedimentary habitat adjacent to the reef um, and expand its conservation measures, which we believe is legally quite correct because it was the features associated with reefs that had to be protected as well as the reefs themselves. That process is look is you can see the detail in some of these management measures here by a site in South Devon. This is called Start Point to Plymouth Sound SAC, and the pink area um, around the, almost the entirety of the site is where there is no access by demersal, that's bottom-toed fishing gears. However, the exciting thing from a conservationist and from an ecosystem recovery point of view is that there are sandy areas um, in the areas between the hatched reef. Um, I'm going to move my mouse around some of them here, and there are buffer zones around the reef. So the regulator could, could have potentially protected just to the edge of the buffer zones around the reefs, but they've decided to go much more expansively to the full limit of the site, allowing a blue area here to be open access only to vessels that have IVMS on it, that's vessel monitoring systems using mobile phone technology to show where the boats are in real time. So you could say the regulator gave a little bit back to the industry by allowing access here to those, bo those fishing boats that wanted to have this technology on, um, but might have, and here gave to the conservation side by protecting large swathes of seabed. Um, and that argument as best is put into a paper that we commissioned with the University of Plymouth in 2013. So what we see is an exciting expansion of conservation measures away from the feature-based approach. Just being wedded to individual features doesn't create expansive MPAs, doesn't create MPAs that are about ecosystem-based management. So very encouraging signs, particularly from the south of England. So in summary, we're nearly at the end here. Um, it's, it's definitely true that damaging fishing is happening in European marine sites across the EU. I was at a presentation in France in May, and it's, it's clear that scallop dredging is happening in merl beds in France at the moment. So this is happening, and um, it needs to be rectified to have, for these MPAs not to be paper parks. Article 6 requires protection in Article 6.2 now, and then assessment before damage can occur for new plans or projects, that's Article 6.3. This matrix this, that we saw earlier that was produced by UK government with the help of science, uh, its scientific advisors also exists in the European context. So it's not that we are alone here. Um, there is a document there produced by scientists, the Marine Natura 2000 X group expert group which would allow other member states to do exactly the same. Um, and I think fundamentally what MPAs are meant to be about and people who are using them, they need clear regulation to know what you can do in a site, to know that you aren't going to be prosecuted or, or you are going to be prosecuted. You've got this is this is the case if you drive on a motorway you need to know the speed limit, otherwise certain people are, are going to be prosecuted and certain people aren't. It's just the same as laws on land. We just need to be clear about it. And the lesson learned, I think, in terms of effective governance of these measures, if at all possible, local or regional groups should promote the new laws um, where at all possible. So back to Catherine. 
Thanks. We just wanted to close by reflecting on the successes uh, of the revised approach in England, although um, we do still have a, a long way to go to be fully satisfied. And just to think back to what worked in our campaign, um, and Jean-Luc and I have uh, concluded that one of the key things to draw out was the fact the campaign was strong because of the respective skill sets that uh, MCS and Client Earth brought to the table. And we pulled out on this slide three things that we think were key and which would be important in any similar campaign in another EU member state. So firstly, of course, to construct a compelling case for change, you need facts. And if you can show that the status quo is causing damage, then you have a really strong platform because that evidence can be used to support any legal arguments that you make. Of course, when you're making your legal arguments, you need to know your way around Article 6 and the case law that um, interprets it, uh, because you will need to anticipate and refute the arguments that might get thrown back at you, as we had to in uh, England. But the third point we decided was uh, relevant to pull out was this, this pragmatism, which I've referred to a couple of times, because regulators do seem to value a willingness to be practical practical rather than just die-hard and extreme. So it was about treading a fine line between condoning a slightly imperfect compliance and actually getting something rather than nothing done. So as I said, we, we ended up um, working within the revised approach, which was over a timeline of four years to bring English waters into compliance, whereas we could have um, stuck to our guns and said uh, that the entire thing needed to be closed immediately. But we wanted to work with regulators, and as Jean-Luc has explained, I think that has borne fruit. This last slide, though, uh, is the toolkit um, that we thought it would be helpful to pull together. These are, excuse me, these are documents that relate to different parts of our campaign. This first section are some of the science um, references. Then in the second uh, batch, you've got some of the legal points. And I just draw your attention to um, point number three in that section, which is new as of yesterday, um, in which uh, we've compiled in one document the legal arguments that we used um, when uh, campaigning in um, England. It is, of course, in English, uh, but many of the arguments could be lifted and translated if NGOs in other member states were, were thinking uh, they would like to use them. Um, clearly, though, uh, arguments are most compelling when they are tailored to the situation. So in that document, we have drawn um, into separate sections the application of our arguments to the English context in case, again, that's helpful to draw parallels with in other scenarios. Uh, in the third section on this slide, you've got information on the revised approach, a link to the matrix we showed you, uh, and various other things. And then that EU document that uh, Jean-Luc referred to just now, that's in the, uh, the last entry on the slide. And as he was emphasizing, the matrix approach is not just a UK phenomenon. Um, and this, this document uh, that's linked here has a similar matrix. I would just note that it's not official EU guidance, but it is certainly persuasive. And because it identifies activities which could have a significant negative impact on protected features, it could be really, really useful to uh, those working in other member states. So that's the end of our presentation. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I believe we now move to questions. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Catherine and Jean-Luc. Uh, again, this is John Davis, MPA News Editor. Uh, we, we now open up the webinar to the audience for the next uh, about 20-some minutes. Uh, if audience members have a question for our presenters, uh, you can submit it in the question box that's on the webinar control panel on screen, and we will be drawing from those questions throughout this uh, Q&A session. Um, start with a, a question. Uh, first of all, this is a fascinating case, and and uh, including the the cultural shift that seems to have occurred in terms of management of inshore fisheries uh, as part of this effort. Um, with regard to your final slides, where you you laid out the criteria uh, for for um, implementing a similar program. Uh, 
with regard to adapting the English experience to other EU member states, what potential obstacles might there be uh, to adapting it elsewhere, um, aside from uh, meeting those criteria that you laid out? Um, Jean-Luc, yeah, I think I can start with one of those. One of those is what, what often, often regulators in other member states will argue that there's not enough evidence um, of actual damage occurring. That, but uh, if, I did mention that there is uh, scallop dredging and trawling occurring in French mole beds. Now, the science that has occurred that I've alluded, we alluded to in our slide earlier that shows uh, it, the same the same impact occurs in English mill beds from trawling as it does in France. The same impacts occur from trawling of Posidonia beds and seagrass beds in the Mediterranean as it would occur in a seagrass bed in the UK. So sometimes the resistance comes from the fact that we need evidence that it's a damaging activity in our patch and that will be thrown at you. Um, another thing that is thrown at you oftentimes is that the fishing is an ongoing activity, it's small scale, these are individual small businesses. We don't deny that, that it makes it perhaps a more difficult social decision to, to make than maybe targeting a major port development or major infrastructural development. Yet it cannot be denied that this is still a damaging activity, so the law still applies. So those are my little words of, of thoughts really. Catherine, do you have anything to add? I think those are some very practical um, differences that um, that you might be confronted with. The only other ones that I would um, highlight are uh, not particular to this particular legal framework, uh, but just in relation to the legal um, setup in in all of the different member states. Uh, just as we were highlighting earlier in the presentation, in the UK, uh, the the kind of governance uh, setup was quite difficult with both central and local regulators not feeling like either had control. I think that would be something that um, you might find in other member states as well and it could be even more complicated by regionalization in certain member states that have a different administrative structure. Excellent, thanks very much. Uh, we have a number of questions coming in so we'll, we'll uh, plow start plowing through these. Uh, do fishermen understand how regulations help the fishing stocks or do they see it as a loss to their personal economy? Uh, and I'd add, um, what role do you see the IFCAs uh, serving in navigating uh, those questions? Uh, there is enough evidence now. <laughs> it's still yet to be wedded to the mindset of the fishing industry, sadly. But many many of these habitats, like mole beds, are fantastic recruitment grounds for scallops. Um, they occur in areas that are not only scallop dredged, but also trawled in Scotland, particularly for nephros fisheries, you know. So um, you could say the fishermen, you know, are, are, are actually uh, of a disbenefit if they don't protect these, these key red features. Um, the brokers of these decisions are the Ithacas. They, 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 they are there in the middle, they're between a rock and a hard place. They've got government on the one side and NGOs saying, you must deliver these things. And on the other side, their members are often made up of fishing interest groups who are of a generation that doesn't understand other things, other, anything other than free use of the sea. Um, it, it, it's just, I hope, a generational change that we have to promote the fact that the marine ecosystem can provide something other than just fish nursery habitat. It can be carbon capture, carbon sequestration. It can be sediment stabilization by seagrass beds, which stops storm damage of coastal fringes. These are the difficult things that have yet to got it, get into the parlance, the common language of the fishing industry. But I am totally enthused by the Ithacas. They're staffed by many people who are under the age of 50 who have been through university education are intelligent people and understand the function of the marine ecosystem and they intrinsically therefore believe in these things called MPAs. Now they're called MPAs but they could be called anything else, it could be fish nursery habitat areas, areas of good carbon sequestration. It doesn't matter to me but it will of course this baggage associated with the term MPA needs a lot of, of being talked and walked through over probably the next 10, 20 years. But the, the first signs are right. If we can persist with this governance structure and the funding is offered to from UK government to keep the Ithacas going, I think there'll be a success at the end of the day. 
Great, thank you. Uh, can you elaborate more on the test of likely significant effects? One for Catherine. Thanks. Test of likely significant effect. Um, yes, that's wording taken from uh, Article 6.3, and that's the first test that you have to apply when you're looking at a plan or project that um, is going to happen in or around one of these protected sites. Uh, I'm trying to think of some key things to say about it. Um, I suppose one of the overarching principles that I didn't go into in uh, the presentation was, was the precautionary uh, principle, which is um, something that's really important to remember when you are looking at EU environmental law. Um, and that is something that we've argued uh, is very um, needs to be front and center when regulators are applying any of these uh, tests. Um, the precautionary approach is really built into um, Article 6 in any event, but that needs to be the mindset with which you approach uh, tests of likely significant effect or indeed the appropriate assessment at a later stage. Thanks, Catherine. Are the described measures already in effect throughout the sites in the UK? Uh, if yes, is there a process to integrate them into management plans to come under the Habitats Directive? And will the new approach also affect the according procedure for sites in EEZ waters? Well, that was a big uh, so, question. Can you repeat um, it, This John? map I've got up at the moment, I hope. Yeah. Yeah, it was a big question. Sorry about that. I'll, I'll do it again. Uh, are the described measures already in effect throughout the sites in the UK? Uh, and if yes, is there a process to integrate them into management plans to come under the Habitats Directive? And will uh, this new approach uh, described in the webinar also affect the according procedure for sites in EZ waters? Uh, maybe I'll deal with the first part of that question and Catherine can deal with the EEZ part. Sure. Um, so I've got the map up of, of the effective management measures. Yes, these are integrated now. Yes, these are, are legal bans on beam otter and scallop dredging, beam trawling, otter trawling and scallop dredging in all these areas. So these are these were passed, as Catherine said, by I think May last year, all these bylaws to protect all these bits of seabed within these European marine sites. Um, some bigger than others, and some we still have issues with, I suppose. Um, now, uh, da, 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 what you will see also within the 12 mile zone here, not the EEZ waters, you'll see areas like this one, which is Margate and Long Sands. And you can tell by the name, it's a sandy habitat. Now, that is an amber site in terms of the, fe the gear feature interaction for trawling over that area. So, that is yet to be enacted in law. And similarly, this side here, and some of the sandy areas of some of the estuaries here, and in northern waters in the northwest of England here and here. Now, whether they have been incorporated into management plans, I am not aware of at this stage. I am aware that this has had a huge amount of publicity within the fishing industry, and it's the fishing industry that we wanted to see, I suppose, managed over this. Um, and the Ithacas, as I alluded to earlier, have a good stakeholder representation that feeds back on any management decisions that are made. Um, unfortunately, funding has been cut uh, by UK government to the practitioners of management plans and uh, for individual sites. I hope that they can incorporate these measures within their plans, but we're pleased that they are on the statute book now. Um, if that's a good enough answer to that part of the question, now I'll leave the EEZ waters, which are outside the 12-mile line, um, to Catherine. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jean-Luc's handed it over to me because uh, once you get into this offshore zone, uh, things do become more complicated uh, because the uh, common fisheries policy, which is um, EU-wide, uh, very important and um, politica politicized policy uh, for European member states um, becomes into play. Uh, in the latest revision of that, it put in place a specific procedure for management measures in sites um, 
including those uh, that are relevant under the Habitats Directive. And um, that complicates matters because essentially, uh, how to explain this simply? Maybe I'll just say that the um, obstacles that uh, you have to jump through in order to get the management measures in place in any agreement, for example, to close a section of the site to a specific type of fishing activity, have to uh, do the rounds of other member states that, uh, whose fishing fleets have a direct interest in fishing in those waters. And you can well imagine that uh, this political dimension, this um, international dimension, uh, makes life a lot more complicated. We are seeing at the moment uh, the UK um, going through, starting the process, I should say, really. They've done a number of stakeholder workshops in relation to these offshore sites uh, where Quite understandably, uh, the fishing industries of not just the UK, but also France, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands were represented. And uh, they were very concerned that um, parts of these sites would be closed. However, we have to come back to the fact that the Habitats Directive, as we've alluded to in this webinar, is quite firm. It's a robust framework where there is going to be a negative impact from this particular plan or project that takes place that needs to be assessed and it can only go ahead under certain conditions. So um, the stakeholder workshops have started, the UK will then have to uh, decide what management measures it's going to propose, then those will go out to the other re relevant member states and at the end of the day it will be the European Commission that will have to decide uh, whether to put the um, what's called joint recommendation, if indeed the member states concerned can get to a joint recommendation, the Commission will decide uh, whether that meets the Habitats Directive requirements and then it will be the European Commission that would put that in place. Thank you. Uh, yeah, certainly a whole new level of political complications uh, with, with the international uh, side of things. Uh, at the national and local level, uh, which is where you've, you've been working uh, on, on uh, uh, with the IFCAs and and uh, and your whole effort on this, uh, what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced in bringing some of these fisheries and conservation stakeholders together, and how did you overcome those challenges? I can think of a, a couple of, of challenges which are the same in any NGO campaign. Um, the challenges of uh, getting your work funded, the challenges of, of having the right capacity at the right time to take the actions that you need to take. But um, as I say, those aren't specific to this particular campaign. Um, I mentioned earlier a couple of points uh, which we really did have to fight with uh, the UK government over in terms of legal argument. Um, I mentioned their long resistance to the fact that fishing should be considered as a plan or project, um, also that ongoing activities needed to be considered. Um, and uh, in, many, in many ways we're, we're still debating that even though the revised approach is well underway and in effect um, the, uh, the assessments that would be required if you accepted that fishing was a plan or project, those assessments are underway. Yeah, I think if I could add to that, in terms of the governance perspective, the government realised that the old committees that were at this regional basis, which were called sea fishery committees, in their membership wasn't fit for purpose for making MPAs anything other than marine paper parks. And that was illustrated by that case I brought up earlier with the press clipping from the telegraph of the scallop dredging in the Val, which is over Merle, which is exactly the issue we have in France at the moment, but also in Lime Bay. And Lime Bay was a process of damage to a, a European marine site, which was yet to be designated actually, but went all the way to the House of Commons and had a whole debate in the House of Commons about why are we allowing these sorts of fishing activity to damage our delicate inshore reefs. So there were some things that got up the political radar before this case and during this case that allowed the, the, the creation of the Ithacas to become a logical reality. And government did that. It wasn't us who said, you need to do Ithacas. We just said, sea fishery committees weren't fit for purpose and they, they made them more conservation focused. So perhaps the pressure led to the management and governance change to make this more resilient. 
Great, thanks. If an activity is deemed to cause some damage, how do you determine what level of damage is acceptable within these sites? Um, theoretically, a balance is needed. How, how do you achieve that balance? Well, this, this is the whole question that we tried to research into in 2013 about site integrity. What, what are we trying to achieve by both the legal understanding of the integrity of conservation features, but also the ecological interpretation. That's that we set our paper from 2013. Um, what, the, what the Habitat Directive is trying to do is trying to create biodiversity and, to a certain extent, recovery of these habitats. Now, if the damage that is ongoing and was ongoing at the time the site was designated is creating a, 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 a biological regime which is of a lower diversity, a lower uh, trophic complexity than would occur if that activity were to be stopped. It should be stopped. And if the scientific literature shows to a certain degree that it could be damaging over something of, of that ilk, and there are, in the ambers, there are some um, references which show no damage, most, a lot of references that show some damage and some, a lot, some references that show quite a lot of damage for sandbank features or sandier or sedimentary habitats from towed gear. Now, it's difficult for the industry to accept that because it wants to tow over sedimentary habitats more than it does reef. But if there is a balance of evidence that is spread across from no damage to quite a lot of damage, we have to be quite precautionary in that because that is what the law states. So that's a difficult one for the industry to take because it's, it believes that the status quo is the thing that is acceptable, but the law doesn't really suggest that that is. And also, a marine protected area in its very essence is only protected if it allows the biodiversity to really be recovering that, or the conservation objectives to be met. So it's a difficult one when there's an amber situation, but um, the four-year process that we're going through is allowing those difficult decisions, I would hope, to be made, even when they are difficult. Excellent. Thanks, Jean-Luc. Uh, we have a question from Duncan Vaughan at, at Natural England. Uh, Natural England uh, works to provide the evidence and conservation advice to the English regulators, uh, both IFCA and MMO, uh, to ensure fishing complies with site conservation objectives. For sites under CFP jurisdiction, it would help Natural England, this is Duncan uh, saying this, in getting ownership of that advice amongst the foreign fleets if MPAs in those member states were managed in a similar manner. Uh, as statutory nature conservation advisor, is there anything that Natural England can provide to help other uh, member states? I kind of think it's already done it. It produced this really fantastic long list of um, references of scientific papers that go through the sorts of issues I've just alluded to. So where you have the biggest issue we have with those areas which are in the North Sea, I'm pointing to them now, because these are sandier habitats. And there is some advice that says, you know, there is, there is damage and there's some advice that says this, these are quite recoverable from towed gears. Now, it's already done it and it's produced a wonderful, I think it's Fishing Evidence Impacts database and I can give it to anyone who's listening to this, this project. And that can be used by any other member state. So it's um, for us, I suppose, as NGOs to get together with other NGOs and talk about these sorts of evidence uh, databases that exist that are of the same habitat and of the same fishing gears. Oh, ben, it sounds like we lost John there. Um, but I think we're at the end of our time right now anyway. Uh, so thank you both so much for presenting. Uh, just note that we will have this webinar archived on openchannels.org in about an hour. Uh, so if you want to uh, refer to that later, we'll have it posted soon. Uh, and again, thank you so much for joining us. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye.